Okay. What's up, beautiful people? Welcome to Africa's Diaspora Podcast. This is your girl Sevla here, um, sitting all the way on the continent of Africa, of course, obviously, in Addis. And I have my friend, family member, um, a brother who's also in, in, in coaching and soccer for young boys. So, Nail, thank you for making time for joining me uh, this morning on your time and afternoon in, in at this time. So thank you for making time. Um, we're going to chat about uh, different experiences and what it takes to coach uh, and teach youngsters. Uh, what can we learn from uh, other country experiences? What can what can we adapt and what can we um, get rid of that is not useful for us and all that stuff? And yeah, different funny stuff that you probably faced <laughs> or you, um, yeah. So we're gonna have a chat and really, really relaxed conversation. And thank you, Neil. I'm gonna give the mic to him um, without further explaining. He's gonna tell us a little bit about himself. Uh, Neil, I'm gonna give the mic to you. Thank you. Hey guys, my name is Neil Crawford. I'm based in Cary, North Carolina, but ironically, I've lived all over the world. As a matter of fact, my connection to Ethiopia is through my wife, Eden, and we met in London. And we have two beautiful sons who, who were born in London, England, and really, really enjoy the game of soccer. Mm -hmm. And so part of my story is actually learning the beautiful game through them okay. and then helping them build more passion and skill around the game. And I've just seen them blossom. And now what I want to do is help others share this message with other parents, other coaches who can help their children through the game of soccer mm -hmm. and then use the game of soccer, football, as it's referred to around the world, yeah. as a prism to understanding more important things about life and improvement. Yeah, I think that's powerful. Um, what I like about the, the whole uh, athletic um, fitness and all that coaching thing is like, a, it is kind of the discipline that it teaches you. And I think that that's also the discipline that we want to implement in, in the future generation and young boys and girls. And um, yeah, I think that's amazing. Cool. Thank you. Um, so... Uh, you are very affiliated with Ethiopia and Ethiopian culture as well. I think you know a lot about Africa, different African cultures. At least it's a it's a learning process continuously. Also for me, um, so just a little bit of fun. So um, tell us the three things that you learned about uh, the Ethiopian culture. Well, first of all, I always tell people I have a PhD in Anjara. Oh I yeah. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So the first thing is I lo absolutely love the food. So that's the first thing. Yeah. The second thing is I love, and I'm going to say the best for last. Okay. I love the coffee ceremony, having some popcorn. I love the whole thing. My parents have done it. My mom enjoys it. We really love the coffee ceremony and the importance that uh, coffee plays in Ethiopian culture. Yeah. And then another thing too is well, we had our wedding ceremony in Ethiopia. I remember. And that was the <laughs> most amazing thing in the world, right? Cool. So that was the first time I ate a little, just a little bit of raw meat, ate some cooked oh, food. Oh, you did? And the, I, just a touch, you know. Okay. And um, I actually saw a cow. Um, they actually prepared cattle for us that were going to be part of the ceremony. And, and then the goat part, that was... <laughs> kind of an eye opener, and it was just so rich in your tradition, yeah, so much reverence, and all of that stuff just taught me the importance of family, the importance of community, mm -hmm. um, and then how the modern culture because our wedding was interesting, it's how modern Ethiopia sort of juxtaposed with traditional values, we're yeah. all in traditional uh customs, we're all put on display in one week, yeah. <laughs> True. It's very exciting. Uh, I think one of the things for me also, like living in different countries, talking to different people from different cultures, you learn a lot and it, it kind of improves your creativity. You get to think outside of the box. And I, that's also one of the things, the reasons that I love doing this podcast is also to inspire the youngsters, not to limit uh, to a certain um, environment, only to certain experience. The world is a big space. There's so much opportunities. 
uh, and there's a, a big part that uh, fitness, athletic um, mindset and all that uh, practice teaches you as a discipline. Cool. Thank you. Um, I think uh, I'm going to go a little bit into the training because I love fitness and sport at, at, at bigger, like any sport, uh, pretty much. And what I realized also coming back to Ethiopia is soccer is a really big thing. Football is a big thing. Um, so I go to a small stadium for running in the morning because it's not convenient so much to run in, in, in the morning on the streets. Um, and I see a lot of boys, youngsters uh, with dads, with their dads, especially on Saturdays, the passion there is. And when Edu was telling me about what you do, I was like, this is uh, this is amazing. I see so many uh, fathers with their little boys, they come there, try to train them, also like implement that um, desire, and they have this strong passion. Um, so tell me, tell us a little bit uh, from from being a coach, being a dad, also uh, of young boys. Um, what is the most um, challenging thing in implementing that uh, mindset and that habit in young in young boys? And what are the opportunities that you see? Uh, also, like considering the Western world at the same time, also considering, you know, Ethiopia and you, you understand the culture and, and most African countries have a lot in common. And yeah, please, for your, from your experience. Yeah. Yeah. So it's actually funny you um, asked me about the biggest challenges mm -hmm. because the biggest challenges is what I actually focus on as a parent. So the, the, so in Western culture, it's not particularly uncommon for parents to help their children in sport. Okay. It's okay. it's not unheard of in the rest of the world, but parents in the states and in the western culture take more on a more of a hands-on approach to helping their okay. kids in sport. That's amazing. Yeah. But the challenge is you don't when you do that, you don't want to overwhelm them. Okay. You don't want to frustrate them. Mm. So the analogy I would use is like uh, blowing a candle or blowing some fire to help it build its own flame. Okay. You gotta you you give them an initial spark that they come with. Okay. And you just slowly blow just a little bit of wind, add a little bit of fuel, but you know if you blow too hard, mm. you're gonna blow it out. Yeah. But if you don't do anything, because in especially in the states, there's so many distractions. Mm. That if you don't do anything, they won't necessarily build this habit of self-determination, yeah. dedication, commitment. True. So you blow a little bit. But at the end of the day, you also have to be ready to let go and let their flame burn. True. If they don't necessarily want to do soccer, mm. that's got to be fine with you as a parent. Okay. So the biggest challenge is what I call it's a chicken and egg dilemma. Okay. We know that in soccer and other sports, they need they we want them to have certain skills early on because mm -hmm. that's going to help them enjoy the game more. Yeah. We know we want them to have a certain mindset because that's going to help them persevere. Mm -hmm. But the problem is you don't want to wait until they're like 14 or 15 where they can truly understand this. True. Because all of that time uh, when they were youngsters is the, is the prime time to help them develop that especially yeah. the skills in the mindset. Yeah. But it's like a chicken and an egg because at that young age, that young tender age, they don't really want to do that. They just want to play. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do you find, how do you strike the right balance? Yeah. And what I tell, what I teach my parents who work with their kids and I teach coaches who work with kids mm -hmm. is I use a, what I call a, a sandwich approach. Okay. I play a lot with my sons. I play a lot. 1v1, free play. We always say, every kid, or at least I always say, every kid loves chasing, tagging, racing, and playing 1v1 with their kid, their okay. parent. Mm -hmm. So we always start with that. Okay. Then we squeeze in a tiny bit of practice. Okay. You know, can you do this? Can you do that? Yeah. And even in that, I always tell parents, the most four most powerful words in the English language are, I bet you can't. If you tell a kid right now, I bet you can't. I don't care what it is. What? I bet you okay. can't. They're gonna they're gonna do it. So I might tell my boys, I bet you can't do, you know, 25 <laughs> juggles in a row. They're on it. That's amazing. And then, and then we end with practice uh, play. 
Okay. Again, so like a sandwich. So they know they did a little bit of practice and we end with play. Mm -hmm. But what's that doing? What's that? What is, what is, what's, um, excuse me, what that is doing is teaching them that you got to do a little bit of practice, mm -hmm. but we're going to have a lot of fun along the way. We get a lot of family time with dad. Yeah. We're going to have a great time, but they start to see those skills um, um, and be improved and implemented. And so that has been my way mm -hmm. of trying to um, deal with this challenge of training my own kids and then training really young kids, at least in soccer. So if I had to give one tip to anyone who's working with kids in fitness, mm -hmm. I wrote an ebook on this. I'll send it to you. Please, yeah. Start every activity. I don't care if it's track. I don't care if it's basketball. I don't care if it's tennis. I don't care if it's football. Start every activity with a game of tag. You're going to get kids changing direct. But you can do this with adults. You do a game of tag and you're going to see people laughing, smiling, running around, having a great time. And they're going to do all of those fundamental movements that are important to athletics. Yeah. And the thing yeah. about a game of tag and I'm going to go to the next question, but this is my passion. The thing about a game of tag is um, you can make up a dis different rules. So you start off by just using your hands. If it's football, then you start off by uh, someone's dribbling a soccer ball. The other person has to tag them. Mm -hmm. Then you can start off. The next one can be if you get tagged, you have to do an exercise. So if you're doing it with adults, for example, you can play a game of tag. And if you get tagged, you got to do two push two push ups before you can go again. If you get tagged, you got to do five jumping jacks. All of that stuff is is very important, but it's really, really fun. Yeah. You see, this is really fundamental, what you just mentioned. Something I also like trying to incorporate. I use a lot of music because uh, yes. a lot of Af Afro beats and stuff like that. Um, so like, literally what you just said, it's like um, if you don't enjoy it, while people are having fun, they're actually staying active. And it's also that uh, I bet you can't do this. It's kind of brings a little bit of competition among the among like I mean adults are also like that now. Nah? So that's why we always have like in conference certain kind of games to uh, to do team building and all that stuff. Yeah, that's a powerful thing. I hope you guys are taking notes. I know I am taking notes because I <laughs> I also like to engage my my girls a lot in <clears throat> in uh, loving fitness and also the yoga and everything that I do. Uh, and something what you just said that I also am taking for myself and I hope everyone who's listening, taking that in and taking notes and maybe slowly implementing that in our, in our life. Also at the same time in our community, in our kids is, um, uh, so starting from at, at a younger age, then it becomes part of you, which is such a powerful thing. Uh, instead of trying to integrate, um, uh, like that habit of uh, active lifestyle, the habit of eating right, all that stuff. Uh, but it, then it grounds up with them from young age. I think it's a powerful thing you just said. Thank you. Yes. Cool. Um, so I don't know if, if like when you are coming here once in a while, I don't know if you have seen the young boys trying to play in the neighborhood and, and all that stuff. Have you ever seen those boys? <laughs> Were you tempted to so, go in there and then coach a little bit? Yeah, well, I was tempted. You know, here's the thing. The last time I was in Ethiopia, I saw a lot of street soccer. Yeah. And like, the thing is, I came from Ethiopia from because I was living in London at the time. Mm -hmm. And it was very easy for us to get, like, soccer jerseys and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So my, my wife asked all of my friends who were traveling with us, bring as many soccer jerseys as you could. Yeah. And one of my fondest memories was just surprising the kid on the street um, with a soccer jersey that they weren't expecting. And they just loved it. Yeah. And it's that passion that I, it is that little bit of joy that I want to be able to spread. And I actually, as part of what I do, I interview people from all over the world mm -hmm. about youth soccer in the area. And I recently interviewed a gentleman, which I'll share the interview with you. I recently interviewed a gentleman from. Ethiopia. He wasn't from Addis. I can't remember which city he was from, but wherever he was from was small. Okay. And he talked about how he never had any coaching. 
he didn't have any soccer balls really. And but he just played before school and played all day, all night, right? Mm-hmm. And then he moved to America around 10 or 11. Okay. And, he, and he saw that he was so good, but he had never had any coaching. And when he got to America, that's when he started like structure soccer. Mm-hmm. But it just shows you that no matter your circumstances, and I don't want to minimize difficult circumstances, but in general, no matter your circumstances, you can achieve improvement. You can achieve success and you can be good at something. Yeah. And I'm actually about to do a podcast where I say the most beautiful thing about soccer, what I love the most about football mm-hmm. is you can improve without having to need a lot of equipment. You can improve without um, needing a lot of space. Yeah. You can have fun with just you and a few friends. True. And I love that about the game. And that's what I'm teaching my sons that Mm -hmm. to get good at something, it starts with you. It starts on the inside. Yeah. Sometimes I think all all you need is you and that, that strong passion that kids have that we see uh, playing on the streets and, and a little bit of such encouragement actually just inspires them that someone is seeing and someone is wanting to help out. Um, it has such a powerful thing. So I was getting some paperwork done here and here in Tobia. So as, as you know, you have kind of long queues and there's a lot of chat going on between people, that thing and this thing. And I was talking, telling him I'm a fitness trainer. Uh, I do personal training and fitness coaching and that stuff. And, it was a, and then he said, like, I used to play football when I was a kid. He said, like, I love football. And he was telling me how passionate he is about it. But um, also a friend of him and all that, this neighborhood game that they had when they were kids. And he said, um, in the end, uh, the coaching didn't continue. So especially my friend who, who my, was, I used to play with would have been somewhere if there was a, a continuing coaching uh, program that would take us somewhere uh, I mean, a little of leadership, coaching, training, mentoring, pretty much uh, is mostly, yeah, one of uh, the lacking things. But something that you just mentioned, also something that taught me, also me living abroad in different challenging and non- non-challenging countries, is um, use what you have, uh, make the most of the times, the utilities, the space that you don't need so much of like uh, other outdoor sport sports, pretty much. Um, you just need a friend and... Um, play football pretty much. So uh, it's personally taught me a lot. Uh, living abroad is, n- is not easy. Uh, away from family, away from uh, everybody. Uh, we've been in Pakistan, we've been in, in South Africa, we've been like a different ca- challenging uh, projects somehow. But what kept me also as a person, kept me going and gave me strength and passion to keep pushing through was the fitness itself. And as much as you're mentioning about the soccer, how much impact it has uh, on the young, the young generation that's coming up, uh, besides the role that we parents play, and I think um, embedding that in children is such a powerful thing. And I was so wowed when Ida was telling me, it's like, what? I didn't know that he was really doing this. And uh, it's amazing. Um, one, one thing that fascinated me, so you made someone from Ethiopia who's, who did football and I think I I listened to that podcast because it was saying like all the way from Ethiopia to United States, all that stuff. Yes. I saw it. Yeah. Oh, you did see it. Okay. I did. I think that's the first thing I listened to from your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. Um, yeah, it's such a it's such an example that uh that transmits to other people, um, other youngsters that they don't lose hope. Uh, that a set, certain scenarios are not going to be an issue to limit them in a way. So, yeah. So, yes. And so let me try to give your listeners some context. Yes. Please. In addition to coach, yes. In addition to coaching, I have this training application and one of our missions is to empower parents with information that can help them help their children. Okay. That's amazing. And, in the States, we can be very culturally myopic for a lot of reasons, but we don't know about the rest of the world. Mm. So an extension of that mission is interviewing people from all over the world because I've been blessed to live in a lot of different countries. I've been blessed to have a beautiful Ethiopian, Abishai wife. 
Yeah. I've been blessed to live in London, so I have a perspective. And it's through that perspective that helps me appreciate sport, helps me appreciate life better, it gives me perspective, mm-hmm. helps me appreciate what I have. Yeah. And so I created this podcast and I go around interviewing people all over the world. I need to get you on the podcast. And while they talk about soccer in their area, what they're really doing is talking about their life mm. through the prism of soccer. And here's the irony. Okay. You learn okay. more about what is happening in your own country by juxtaposing your country to the various other countries. So mm. you learn more about yourself by learning about others. Yeah. How many Americans know what it's like to grow up in Ethiopia and play football as a kid? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I got to, hey, you know, I'm going to answer that for question for you, me, me and a few other people, yeah. right? And a few of the listeners listen to podcasts. True. And so I wanted to go to Ethiopia, Germany, mm-hmm. you know, Ghana, Spain, and talk to people about their life and what football is like in their country. Mm-hmm. And I'm doing that also to create an audio diary for my son. I ain't got no money to leave. That's a powerful you know, thing. But I got a digital. They're going to be able to have a video of me. And they're going to also be able to put a lot of the things that they have. And they're too young to appreciate it now. Mm-hmm. But they're going to be able to put it in perspective. And they're going to say, wow, mm-hmm. Teddy, he was in the Ethiopia. No coach, no uniforms, just playing in the streets, doing the best he can. He saw other kids and he wanted to get better on his own. He didn't have somebody holding his hand, telling him when to go to practice and when not to go to practice. And then he comes to America. And this is the story of one of the podcasts that I'll I'll share with you guys from Ethiopia. He comes to America and everyone sees that he's a brilliant question. And Mm. so you have to ask yourself, you have to ask yourself why? Because he has a passion. He has self-determination and he did the things on his own. And sure. now that same guy in Ethiopia has a big training clinic in um, Austin, Texas, where he is now teaching American kids how to play football the Ethiopian way. That's a powerful, you know, power. so powerful. Creativity, <laughs> flair, yeah. show, show, you know, this kind of thing. And that's what he's teaching folks. Cool. I think everyone should listen to that podcast, guys. <laughs> Um, drop it in the show notes please yes i will i will definitely um that's amazing it's, it's like I'm, I'm also being inspired right now <laughs> uh mm. because sometimes it 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 gets tough to push through you know how life is wherever we are in the world it's always like there's always a version of challenging things that uh we all go through uh, but yeah, I mean, just listening to such podcasts, listening to people who are sort of pushing through and trying to do something amazing is always, uh, it's like, oh, we are connecting. We are doing um, what we can with what, what we have and inspiring the youngsters. That's amazing. Um, okay. That's amazing. Um, so um I'm going to take you back to uh, a little bit of family and you understand a, a little bit of uh, Ethiopia. Like this uh, different traveling kind of lifestyle teaches you a lot and something you have said also like the perspective and the way you see people and the way you see understand people varies a lot. So, so I know how to communicate with a Pakistani guy or Pakistani girl uh, because I've lived there. I understand the culture, what kind of food that we should be ordering and all that stuff. So um you knowing the Ethiopian culture, you know that there's a lot of common things among other different African countries. Um what what we like to eat. I mean, we have one thing in common, at least uh, spicy foods. <laughs> yeah. I think everybody likes spicy food. Um yeah. Um so what opportunities do you see having these different experiences, having uh, this much knowledge and um, uh, seeing different, like especially talking to this um, this football uh, topics and uh, talking to different people from different countries um, and uh, neighborhood football games. Uh, what do you see is the opportunity um, 
for young boys within Africa, not just um, uh, US, not just maybe Germany, because I'm also very affiliated with the German uh, community somehow. Um, but specifically with Africa, um, what what opportunities do you see? What what do you think is something we can do? Um, I don't know to to help out different youngsters as well. Besides, yeah, okay, go ahead. <laughs> well, I, so here's the thing. I I am not going to be able to give you a specific answer, but I will tell you how I, I thought about this thing when I was in Ethiopia. Okay. And then having lived in England and the states and in Asia. Okay. And I'll use the states for example. There are, are a lot of um industries, I'll say. There are a lot, there's a lot of commerce. There are a lot of companies doing things here in the in the in the uh states mm -hmm. that are an afterthought here. Okay. That if you brought that concept to Ethiopia, if you brought those, if you brought that to um uh, other parts of Africa would be massive. Okay. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm looking over the next 10 to 20 years, mm -hmm. there's going to be a transformation in sort of the opportunities for children mm -hmm. through um, people doing things to have, um, you know, from a business perspective, yeah. but also from a holistic help in the community. Okay. So you may, you may say, well, Neil, what are you talking about specifically? Well, you have to remember that my parents' generation, mm -hmm. my parents' generation, in terms yeah. of their childhood, would not have been, especially my dad, he grew up in a very rural area, would not have been holistically different than the experiences that many Ethiopian children experience now. Okay. Like, no shoes. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about in the rural areas, yeah. not Addis. Yeah. No shoes. You know, not going to school all the time, um, having to work in farms and stuff, very agrarian. That was my ch father's childhood. Yeah. And you fast forward just a generation later, mm. and then he has sons who all college educated and doing their thing. And then the next generation, which is his grandchildren, we are investing a lot of time and energy into our own children mm. in a way that my parents would not have thought. Yeah. It was not a priority. Yeah. And yeah. because we're investing all this time and energy in our children, there are a lot of businesses propping up to support us. True. And I'm saying all of that opportunity is in Ethiopia. So let me give you an example. Yes, please. One of my <laughs> one of my son's favorite places to go is these yeah. trampoline parks. Oh yeah, yeah. They love these things. Yeah, they, they do. Go they jump in here, they jump in there, they jump and jump in all these little trampoline parks. Mm -hmm. And trampoline parks are not specifically or particularly complicated. They're just trampoline parks. Yeah. But yeah. they're great fitness and they're great fun. And, with my, and I, what I'm trying to explain is in mm -hmm. my dad's generation, the notion of parents paying for this type of thing, service for their kids would have been inconceivable. Yeah, true. Even in my generation, it would have been borderline inconceivable. Mm. But now it's standard here in the States. Okay. And I'm saying over the next 10 to 20 years, mm. I can see inter enterprising people like yourself from the diaspora saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> this is big. This is big in the States. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to bring one of these to mm. Ethiopia. Mm. You know, yeah, and so more of that is happening. My wife shared a video of me, of uh, shared a video with me of a lady who's already doing that with sporting facilities. Yeah, in Ethiopia, a lot has progressed. It's actually amazing. A lot is happening. Mm. So I might be just telling you guys what you already know, but the yeah. bottom line I'm saying is, yeah. every time my wife and I see something, we always like, man, if they bring that to Ethiopia, it's going to be massive. Yeah, she was saying that as well. <laughs> True. Yeah, it's like, man, you should do like, yeah, she was saying the same thing. True. So that's wow. the biggest opportunity I see are things here that we take for granted will True. be massive there. And you have an opportunity to get ahead of the curve mm -hmm. if you can fight through the challenges and obviously you have to have some capital. Yeah, true. True. Awesome. Um, that's amazing. Uh, I think um, 
last but not least, I'm going to ask you, um, so maybe five, three tips that you would say uh, someone, someone like you and me, who's also do, doing all this uh, fitness, also uh, married to different culture, different background, who lived different places. Uh, what do you think is the top three advices that you can give? Uh, yeah. Suggestion. Yeah. So, all right. In addition to everything I do. Yeah. I love I, as a beginner. studying, even though I'm not particularly successful. I love, love studying okay. successful people and things that they've done to make them successful. All right. So, again, this is not specific advice about anybody's specific area mm. in life. Yeah. But 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 what it what success st distills down to is number one. Think it. Mindset. Okay. You got to have the mindset. Mm. You have to see what you want. You have to visualize what you want in great detail. Mm. Right. Yeah. And then fixate on that. Okay. Take what I do. <laughs> what I do okay. is I have these little index cards. Okay. And on one side, on the blank side, I write my goal, what I want. Okay. That one thing on each index card, mm. whatever that is, very specific. And then on the other side with the lines, I write down all the things I need to do this week to get that. Mm-hmm. So, for example, I have a business where I sell things to soccer clubs, yeah. basically. So an example would be on the right, on the back, on one side, I might say, I want to get one new soccer club this week. Okay. What do I need to do to get that? Mm -hmm. I, now on this side, I have to do some research. Yeah. I got to make some phone calls. I got to email. And I have to stick to that because this is my goal. and I've written it down. The tasks are broken down so so that you can you exactly break them down very specific. Implementable uh, bricks, li literally, in bricks and layers that you have to put into to get it where it needs to be, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you had to give me, a, if I had to give you a framework on being successful, number one is you got to think about it. It's got to be here, right here. 100%. Vision. You got to think about it. You, it has to be in your mind. It, everything yeah. starts with, everything starts with a belief, a belief in yourself and a belief that this is going to happen. 100%. And I'm going to tell you something. You mm. may not even know how it's going to happen. You got to yeah. believe it. Mm -hmm. This has been written. This has been written in the religious text. Yes. You got to have faith. Yeah. I don't care who, who you believe in, whatever. You got to believe in what you can't see. Exactly. If you, can't, if you don't believe in what you can't see, it's hard to be successful. Yeah, it is. It's hard if you got to believe it. Yeah. Now, if now guess what though? No, just because you think it doesn't mean it's going to happen. You got to put deeds to actions. Yeah, absolutely. And absolutely. one tool you can. Everybody has their own way. One tool I suggest: get you a stack of index cards. Get you some paper. I don't care what you do. Get something and write down that thing that you want. Yeah. And you got to yeah. look at it. Put yep. it under your pillow. You better think about it. Yeah. And whatever that is, then you start writing that thing down in tangible, tangible action steps. Yeah. And one process I do is I get out a piece of, uh, get a bunch of index cards. I scatter them out and I just write on each index card, my vision, what I want. Hmm. They call these vision boards. Yeah. Hey, yeah. I want to. I want to do this. I want to do a trip to Ethiopia. I want this. I want that. And then on the other side, I start thinking about, okay, what do I need to do to get there? Yeah. And then I translate that specific way of uh, that specific framework to my own business. Mm -hmm. Right. I want to get this many customers. Okay. Well, what are you trying to do to get there? Mm -hmm. And guess what? And so then the final thing you asked me for three, I'm going to give you four. And then you have to have perseverance. Absolutely. Right. Yes. And everybody says it. Everybody says it. Everybody says this. But it's not until you're in the trenches. It's not until you get your heart broken mm. that you realize it's not until you do the best you can and people turn around and tell you, you trying to you just trying to be this, you trying to do that. And you're like, wait a minute, I'm trying to help. 
you got to persevere. Yeah. You you gotta have to persevere. And here's the final thing. And this, this is what I teach my sons. You can do all of this. You can give your heart and soul to something mm. and it may not work. It may fail. And you got to be comfortable with that. If you're not comfortable with failure, absolute failure and starting over, mm -hmm. then you need to get a job and support somebody else's dream. Yeah. But if you have your own dreams and you have your own aspirations, that comes with the potential of failure. Yeah. I'm comfortable yeah. with failure. <laughs> be comfortable with failure. <laughs> I'm comfortable with failure. So I'm comfortable. Do True. everything I can. Best job I can. Yeah. But if it doesn't work out, I try my best. I can live with myself. Here's what I don't want to do. I don't want to be 80 years old and look back and say, man, I, I really could have started that. that. I mm -hmm. wish I could have done that. And so that's that's my tips for you guys. I hope you I hope you take it to heart. Thank you so much, Neil. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys are super inspired, super encouraged um, this morning. OK, this afternoon in our, <laughs> in our <coughs> different time zones. Thank you so much. I hope you all feel inspired as much as I I hope you took notes. And yeah, thank you so much, Neil. Thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, inspiring us. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. Cool. Um, so on socials, you can find us at uh, Sable underscore Tenachin on Instagram or on YouTube, Sable Tenachin by Sable. Where do they find you on socials, Neil? Yeah, so you can look for Anytime Soccer Training. Anytime okay. Soccer Training. If you search for that, you can find me online, social media, and any outlet you use to find information. Awesome. Tag us, uh, share with friends and family. Let's keep inspired. Let's keep supporting each other. Peace, love, right, Africa. Let's go.